Well, the origins of permaculture for me were when I was a design student in Tasmania in the 1970s, uh, studying environmental design in a course that was probably the most radical experiment in tertiary education in Australia's history. And I was at the end of my first year of amazingly free exploratory studies in urban planning, architecture, um, uh, landscape architecture and I became interested in the intersection between ecology, landscape architecture and agriculture which seems to me a, seemed to me a, something where there was no connection. Sometimes I could see a connection between two of those but not uh, the three and I met uh, this amazing man um, Bill Mollison who was actually a senior tutor at the psychology faculty in another institution and um, but appeared to me uh, an amazing ecological thinker in the way I thought ecological thinking what it was about and uh, I was actually um, developed this relationship with him moved into his house and and we were discussing my plans for this focus in my course in the second year and uh, he said, oh, that's really interesting. Well, he said, how about this for an idea? If mostly nature produces a forest as the most productive and sustainable system on, across most of the Earth's surface, why doesn't our agriculture look at least functionally, if not just physically, something like a forest? And I said, oh, that's, that's exactly what I'm interested in. And that became the beginnings of a passionate, full-time, total immersion uh, with Mollison effectively as my informal mentor, no relationship in my academic work, to an intensive study that um, led to the, the Permaculture Manuscript, which was later published as Permaculture One in 1978 and was the starting point of, of permaculture as a, a public concept. So uh, it's, it's something that emerged between the two of us at a time when there was a huge wave of interest in what we call, might call sustainable solutions today. Um, before the term sustainability actually was in the, in the lexicon, uh, before there was any serious discussion of uh, climate change. But at the time that there was this intense discussion about the limits to growth because of the limits of resources characterised by the oil crises and the limits of the environment reflected in pollution and biodiversity loss and land degradation. So permaculture came out of that, what I call that sort of first wave of modern uh, environmentalism and not just oppositional environmentalism but very much the positive uh, environmentalism of um, what are the solutions and even more so than that not just what are the solutions that those at the top should implement but how are the way we're just going to go out and create the world we do want and the work that is uh, the world which is uh, sustainable. While Bill Mollison was taking the permaculture ideas to the world, I was only in my early 20s and I wanted to actually ground all these ideas in the huge practicality of uh, ecological building, of organic gardening and uh, agroforestry systems and aquaculture and all the practical skills as well as the of course the design processes that permaculture was about. So I put myself through a, uh, a really intensive self-teaching um, education process that has never stopped. Um, along the way I've earned a very modest livelihood doing consultancy work and teaching and in more recent years uh, publishing and since the mid 80s myself and my partner Sue Dennett have been here in central Victoria developing this very modest small property of about a hectare as our home and being involved in various ancillary and complementary projects in our local community while occasionally venturing out into the wider world, uh, very occasionally overseas. Uh, 
and uh, mostly I suppose taking advantage of the amazing world that we can live a home-based simple lifestyle that's low impact and highly resilient and incredibly rich and rewarding at home in a place away from the centers of power and wealth and yet still be connected to the world by and have influence in the world by all the incredible advantages of, of modern media. Well I suppose the core of, of permaculture thinking is that we are a subset of nature. Uh, the principles that govern what we do are in the broadest sense are the same principles that govern nature. Um, and that that's quite a strong, if you like, if you like ideological position from, you know, what some people might criticize as ecological determinism or biophysical determinism. You know, in the same way that when I met Mollison, he was teaching something that was sort of like a course like sociobiology hybridised with environmental psychology and showing people experimentally that a lot of people's behaviour just in everyday life was actually basic primate behaviour. You know, that so we are what we always ever have been and understanding that our animal nature, the fact that we are social animals is very, very clear in our evolutionary history uh, and of course that is a bit of a shock to some people coming from the individualist modern sort of conception and I think that's very deep in our nature you know any ecologist studying humans you know okay they're called anthropologists but imagine it's just being another animal <laughs> uh, then we are very very clearly social animals and we have survived through 99.98% of our human history totally through our collective uh, structures. So understanding how those collective structures have worked before the huge, exceptional, unusual, maybe interesting, maybe completely dysfunctional aspects that have happened in modernity, understanding how people lived in traditional and indigenous societies is one of the core ideas of permaculture in the same way that we study how did people actually grow food um, or gather from the environment as a, a way of informing how we should design new ecological uh, models. So that part of that lineage is saying look a lot of the thinking that we've developed in what's called the European Enlightenment and in a lot of modern ideas of thinking there are other perspectives uh, both from other cultures but also most importantly from times before we had this limitless power from fossil energy. So the concept of reading landscape which I've been teaching for decades in permaculture came about when I realised how much we needed to learn by direct observation that we couldn't learn from books or couldn't learn by being told something by people and that people's skills, my own skills, in being able to open oneself to what is around and connect with that and to be able to see not just what is, but what was here yesterday by the sign of what is, or what was here 10 years ago, or what was here a thousand years ago, or what was here 400 million years ago when this rock was forming under the sea. To actually be aware of all that, not just in some intellectual way, because you sort of read it in a, a book, but to gradually build up that pattern language of the environment around you. And this was actually an essential skill for people who were wanting to be permaculture designers. Because in fact, there was a limited amount of documented knowledge and limited amount of what you could learn from, oh, just talk to the person who's like fifth generation on that site because they didn't exist or weren't uh, uh, around. And I think that is perhaps connected 
a stepping stone towards that opening of what becomes even intuitive connection and, and perhaps even spiritual connection, even though that's not my framework or, or, or starting point. Sue always says that uh, I actually do have quite an intuitive ability, but I come from a background of being a super rationalist. <laughs> and the, the, it's certainly very true that a lot of the best understandings that I've been able to uh, develop have been through this working relationship with nature rather than just repetitively oh yeah we did that every year in the last year and therefore we know x y and z not just that lessons learned from hard won experience but being able to see by a contemplative awareness uh, uh, of actually taking the time, the sort of tradition that came out of field naturalism that, well, you know, we don't want to particularly know to do some particular task, or we're just curious, you know, to understand nature, to see what happens, and and that then we start to see all the patterns and and understand connections, and to see the the signs of things from the past and then of course the next level is to actually imagine where nature is going like what will it look like in another hundred years so i think there is a connection between that and indigenous ways of understanding the landscape uh, and understanding perhaps then also flowing over into other people and in teaching reading landscape, I say to people, look, we all have some skills in this, just the way we all have some skills at reading people. Some of us are good at it, some of us are not so good at it, and we all can get better at it. Uh, so I think those things are a part of permaculture. And in reading landscape, I've taught that if we are in a rush till we want us to achieve some goal, then this doesn't sort of really help. We've got to be prepared to be just open and we ac accumulate understanding that turns out to be useful in some context over time. But if we are goal oriented and are in a rush, then, you know, it's better to go off and get the recipe out of the book or do what you're told or, um, you know, because people go, how can I learn by just staring at, you know, what's going on? You know, what is it? Where's the answer? Just tell me. <laughs> and so that, no, it's just uh, the, the answer is to uh, that deeper awareness. Now, part of my caution, of course, is we can project all our emotions and our angsts and uh, into those things and say, oh, I just had the feeling that this was exactly the right place for me. Oh yeah, it was a sunny day in spring. And, uh, you know, so that what could be the deep intuition could maybe be superficial emotional fluff <laughs> and uh, um, uh, prejudice and uh, whatever. So I remain this sort of skeptical that sort of scientific skeptic about the insights that come because they are not like the transparency of science. Oh yeah, that's self-replicable. We, that's been done. Yes, it's, but it's repeatable science. It's not like that, but I think it's real. And it's, uh, yes, it's a way of working that is a, a, a deeper uh, wisdom that, um, works when we slow down, when we attune ourselves more. I talk about how the sense, our senses are all turned down because of the harsh on, off, digital, bright, heavy sensory input from our industrial urban world. Whereas you take teenagers out into nature and they go, what's going on? There's nothing happening. You know, because we need to turn up the volume 
turn up the sensitivity to see the subtle, the small, the slow moving uh, things. And maybe that's the same with people. What is someone, re what's the really underlying thing that is behind what someone is saying? Where are they coming from? What is their history, their lineage? You know, what pain are they carrying, you know, as they, you know, or what hidden powers do they have that we can't see? You know, capabilities or, um, and yeah, people can be completely surprising, I suppose, in the same way that uh, nature can be. So, yeah, maybe there's a strong connection there.